Well, now that you've done the pH titration lab, I thought it would take a little bit of time to show you how to use the data to figure out the pKa and Ka of the acid. So I'm using a spreadsheet program. I'm using Google Sheets. It's free and uh, you might find that it's pretty easy to use. It does pretty much everything we're going to need it to do. If you want to use Excel, that's fine. Uh, you need a spreadsheet program that can do some calculations for you and that can um, create charts. All we're doing is XY scatter plots so that you don't need anything fancy. Uh, I've gone ahead and put in some sample data that I got when I did this lab about eight years ago. And uh, you can see that my uh, interval is, is about a milliliter, but it's not really a milliliter. And what's important is that you have really accurate volume measurements. And uh, so I tried to add about a milliliter at, at each point here, but I didn't necessarily do that. But I did record my volume on my burette very uh, carefully. And since your burette is graduated into the tenth of a milliliter, you have to estimate the hundredths. You should all have two decimal places in your volumes. I also then put in the pH values uh, that correspond to those volumes. And again, you should have two decimal places because the pH probe that you used had two decimal places. So uh, nothing unusual there. If you haven't done this yet, if you haven't already set up your spreadsheet, uh, go ahead and pause the video and uh, set it up now. You may also want to set up the other column headings that I have here, and I will explain what those mean when we continue. So go ahead, pause the video, and put your data into a spreadsheet, and restart the video when you're ready. So the next three columns are what we're going to use to crunch the data. But before we do that, we want to take a look and see what our data looks like graphically. Uh, so we're going to plot. And uh, I put the volume of sodium hydroxide first and the pH second because I want to sort of uh, graph it with at the volume on the x-axis and pH on the y-axis. That's the way most spreadsheet programs default. So if you can go ahead and put them in that order, that's great. Otherwise, you're going to have to do some selections of your data sets. Uh, with Google Sheets, there's a little button up here that looks like a little bar graph. That's your insert chart button. And uh, if you go ahead and do that, you're going to probably not see the scatter plot in this area. You're going to choose more. You're going to choose scatter in the top version. And you'll see a little example of what it might look like. You can hit customize. You can add a chart title. We'll call this uh, volume of sodium hydroxide versus pH for acetic acid. Okay. The background is fine as white. We're just looking using this as a graphical representation of what's going on here. I'm going to maximize it so that it takes up a little bit more space. The uh, horizontal axis then is going to be the volume of NaOH. And that's of course in milliliters and I'm going to then switch to the vertical, left vertical axis, which is called uh, pH, and that'll be that. I don't need to really do too much more as far as access labels. Uh, I think that's everything I need for the chart. I'm going to hit insert. It's actually back up here at the top, but I'm going to be printing this chart, and so are you, so you're going to want to make sure that you have it in its own sheet. So if you click somewhere in the chart with Google Sheets, you'll see a little arrow drop down menu up here, and you can choose right at the bottom, move to own sheet, and it will do that for you. Now, what you've got here is a very nice looking S-shaped curve. If your volume and pH values work out rather nicely and you measure your pH accurately, you should have a very nice little S-shaped curve. And what we're interested in here is the point at which we just neutralize the acid with the base. That's called the equivalence point. And the equivalence point in a pH titration can be found by looking at the vertical section of the graph right in here. It's actually the point at which the slope uh, changes in inflection, changes direction. So it's the, called the point of inflection. And we could figure this out graphically, I suppose, if we went back and we did some advanced editing on our uh, graph. We could put in the grid lines and we might print it out and then we can maybe use a ruler to figure out where the point of inflection is. But that's a lot of work and it doesn't always work out so well. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the first derivative to figure out 
what the volume of base is at the point where the slope changes. Now, uh, that sounds all difficult, but the first, first uh, derivative is nothing more than calculating or determining the slope of this line uh, at every point. Since the line is curved, it doesn't have a continuous slope. The slope changes as you move around. What we're interested in is the slope during this nearly vertical part. And the point uh, where we can find the, the greatest slope is the point of inflection. And so that's what we're going to do. So it's very simple. If you remember that slope is just change in y over change in x, the, the y-axis is the pH, the x-axis is the volume. So what these two columns here, C and D, mean are the change in volume D in calculus is used. It's essentially just uh, standing in for, for delta. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but that's good enough for us. So I am going to calculate the change in volume for each interval that I add. Now, I don't really have an interval for the first sp space here in number four, but uh, my first interval is actually going to be the difference between the 0.99 milliliters and the 0 0.00 milliliters. Now, I want to do that all the way down, so the easiest way to do it is to write the formula so it equals, and I'm going to subtract A5 minus A4. And when I do that, I get my 0.99, obviously. But if I then click on that, grab the little handle in the lower right-hand corner and drag it all the way down, it will go ahead and do my interval for me. So there's my change in X value, my run, if you will. The rise is going to be done the same way with pH. So I do equals, and again, it's the difference from the larger one minus the smaller one, or the second one minus the first one, if you want to look at it that way. And so the difference between 3.10 and 2.86 is 2.24. That's my difference in pH, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to grab it and, and pull it down. Okay. Now, the third column that I've set up here says D, pH, over ML, which if you distribute the D, not to be too, too technical about it, but basically it's the change in pH over the change in volume, which is the change in Y over the change in X, which is slope. And since this is a curved line, the slope is going to be different for every interval that we do. But we'll just let Excel do our sheets, do all the work. So we just do equals, and it's going to be pH divided by volume. Hit enter, and then click and drag it all the way down. Okay, so Let's take a look at what that's going to look like if we now graph. I'm going to now graph the volume. So I'm going to select the volume column here. That's my A column. I'm going to select all of that. I'm going to hit the chart button, and I only have one set of data. I need I need another data range. I need the the y values, and so the y values are going to be that first derivative column. So if you if you're in sheets, uh, you're in the data. You're going to select range. We've already chosen A. 4 to A62, that's our A column, that's our volume. That'll default to the x-axis. We're going to then click that little button. We're going to add another range. Uh, I'm going to move this out of the way so I can select the range I want to add. I want on the y, I want to use my uh, derivative here. So I'm going to actually select the whole column. And there we go. And hit OK. I need to go and choose a scatter plot again. This one. And we get this. Um, I will uh, go to customize. I'll add for the chart title. I will call this first derivative uh, versus volume NA. Which probably should be volume NAOH versus first derivative, but you can change that on this. Uh, I am going to maximize it again so that I can take a look at it a little bit closer. I'm not going to put in my uh, my volume label. Well, yeah, let's do it. Let's be let's be correct about this. Okay, so let's put in our chart title uh, uh, axis titles. So our horizontal axis is again volume of n H, and that's n milliliters. And then our vertical axis is actually we can just write in d and then in parentheses pH over ml which is the first derivative. Um, there's really no units so much. I guess it's technically, it would. well, pH has no units, so the units would be 1 over ml, but it doesn't really matter. 
Uh, we can then go ahead and insert that. We'll go up here. We will make it its own sheet because this is another thing that you're going to need to print. And now looking at this, we've got most everything down here, and then we've got this big spike in the center. And this big spike in the center, the maximum value here, is the point at which the slope changes. It's the, the point of inflection. That's the equivalence point. And again, you could sort of determine where it is by looking at uh, the grid lines, putting in the grid lines and looking at it, but we don't have to do that. We can go back to our raw data, and all we're going to do now is scan down this row, this column, the first derivative column, and find the place where the derivative is a maximum, which would be right here, 14.00. That's the largest value that we get for our first derivative. That's the point of inflection. That's the equivalence point. It happens in my data at 19.12 milliliters. That is my equivalence point. Okay? Now, the equivalence point is not what we're actually looking for. What we're actually looking for is the half equivalence point. And I'll explain how that works in just a second. So go ahead and finish up your calculations, make your graphs, and uh, we'll tell you what to do with that as soon as you've done. So pause the video and come back when you're ready. Okay, so we have the equivalence point. More importantly, we have the volume of base required to get to the equivalence point. But that's not really what we want. What we want is something called a half equivalence point, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's half of the volume required to get to the equivalence point. What we're working with here is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which remembers pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the salt form over the acid form. Another way of saying that is the log of the base over the acid. And at half equivalence point, so halfway to the equivalence point, uh, when we get exactly halfway, the number of moles of base will exactly equal the number of moles of acid. Now, if the number of moles of base is equal to the number of moles of acid, then the salt form concentration, the concentration of hydroxide, uh, of the, or the sodium acetate, if you want, the conjugate base of the acid, and the concentration of the acid should be equal. And if they're equal, then the log of that is 1, log of 1 is 0. And that means that at the half equivalence point, pH is equal to pKa. And so that's how you're going to find the pKa. Don't forget that you then need to use the anti-log to find the actual Ka value. So you'll do 10 to the negative Ka, uh, pKa value. And that will give you your anti-log. And it'll give you your Ka value. And that's all there is to it. So get to it and we'll see how you do it.